silence your cell phones. Hold them close to our chin when we talk. Not out of here, but close in. Um, okay, we're maybe Edgar will show up. Is, is Edgar coming? Did anyone speak with Edgar? I thought he would. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe he'll walk in and join us um, a little bit later. Um, okay. So, without further ado, um, hi, my name is Sean Barnes. I'm the gallery. Here at the Leo, Leonora R. Kohler Gallery uh, in the Kenneth J. Menard Center for the Arts at South Puget Sound Community College. And you are at the uh, SPSEC uh, Art Faculty and Staff Exhibition. Artist talk. We're going to talk. Um, and uh, before I begin, I just want to remind everyone that we are on indigenous land. South Puget Sound Community College is located on the ancestral lands of the Stachos Band of the Squaxin Island Tribe and the Squally Indian Tribe, who have long been stewards of the region's waters, plants, and animals. The southernmost point of the Salish Sea, these lands were and still are a place of gathering, trade, and community for many Coast Salish peoples. We recognize that all who are not Salish peoples are visitors here, and we commit to join these peoples to share their history, build relationships, increase representation, and restore the living world around us. One of the ways, many ways, that SPSCC honors this, uh, this acknowledgement is through our Native American Art Exhibition. Uh, this year, uh, the exhibition opens November 13th. It's being curated by Yvonne Peterson, uh, who is Shehalis. And this exhibition will be a, um, a selection of weavings uh, by Hazel Peet and a few other um, weavers from uh, the Shehalis community. The reception is November 17th, and there will be a talk on a Monday, November 27th at 6 p.m. Um, that'll, be, that'll be a real joy. Also, uh, what's happening next after this exhibition uh, is visiting artist Nishiki Sugawara Beda is uh, coming up from Texas. That exhibition opens on October 6th, and there will be a reception and art talk that same night. So that's next Friday, reception and artist talk with Nishiki. Um, all right, so tonight I have the great pleasure and honor to be sitting with my colleagues and friends here at SPSEC, and I just want to say that I, I'm not sure that we've done anything like, I know we haven't done anything like this um, as I've been in the gallery, Joe would probably have the institutional knowledge about that, but just to get, um, I'm, I'm overjoyed to be sitting here with you guys just to talk about your art and teaching practice, right? And just to have a conversation about that. Um, normally, you know, we're talking about the artwork, um, but we do something special and extra, I think, as artists and teachers and um, folks that work in the arts. So, um, so I'm hoping that this will, I don't know what's gonna happen, right? <laughs> Most of the time with artist talks, we, we've got a, a steady banter, but um, I've put together some questions that we may just rip on, um, but we'll see where, where this all goes. Um, and so I'm gonna, just gonna introduce folks real quick. Um, to my immediate left here is Bruce Thompson. Um, Bruce teaches ceramics, drawing, intro to art, printmaking, what else? Is that it? Photogra digital photography. And then we have uh, Michael Gray, uh, film instructor, uh, Krisha Yantis, who's uh, uh, teaching in ceramics, 
John, uh, John Brooks is our uh, instructional tech in ceramics and also drawing and painting and printmaking and digital photography. Um, and Liza Brenner uh, teaches painting, art history, drawing, um, anything else? That's, that's pretty much it. And then our Honorable Dean, Melissa Mead, also is here, a uh, humanities dean uh, as a writer, accomplished writer and scholar. And then uh, we have Stephen Davis, who teaches digital photography. And then Joe Batt, uh, who's also teaching ceramics and mixed media and drawing and sculpture when we're, when we're more, when we've got more student body. Um, so anyway, this, oh, and I'm Sean. I teach drawing and watercolor and uh, sometimes I've done sculpture once, I guess. Um, but anyway, give us a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the way this uh, usually breaks down, right, we talk for a little while, and then uh, you all can ask us some questions afterwards, and then uh, and then we can just mill about and look at the work and and hang out and, and visit. So. Um, but I thought I'd just kick us off with one big question. I don't care who grabs it, um, but somebody please do so I don't have to call on anyone. Right? Um, and first question is just a real, uh, you know, what, what inspired you to become a teacher in the arts? What, whoever wants to. me what inspired me some of it is fortune to be able to be able to teach in the arts and then a component of it is that what I found my place in the studio where I was always welcome with my community and my mentors created a place that made me want to be there and it was kind of a home for myself to feel comfortable and over time, I, I just felt like it was a, it, a good fit for me to want to continue to see if I could carry on that and pass that along to others. Anybody else? Liza? Sorry. <laughs> Hello. OK. Um, the first thing that popped in my mind was I wasn't good at anything else. <laughs> so that's, it was just, that was just where I felt comfortable and I just remember just hanging out in the art room um, and then like in high school all the time and then when I got to college, it was just like, that just was a good fit for me because again, <laughs> that's what I excelled at so I just kind of stuck with it. Um, and here I am today. Was it, was it like an instructor that was like, you should teach? Or, you know, I, how did you find your way into... I think I just enjoy uh, making a difference. And I think as just being an artist, um, first of all, <laughs> my mom was like, you're not going to make a living doing that. Um, <laughs> And I just felt like teaching, again, that's the way I could make a difference. Um, I don't think there was one instructor who, I mean, I loved all my instructors, but I just felt like, yeah, teaching would be the way I could change or make it, not change the world, that's really cheesy, but maybe change somebody's life, you know, um, that was also interested in art and make a difference that way. Oh, uh, the money. It's really, really good. <laughs> uh, I was a first generation college student. I went uh, to community college, uh, you know, I'm interested in uh, the healthcare field mostly. wanted to make money. Um, and I didn't know much about art, but I had to take an art class, like a lot of folks here at South Sound do. And I was introduced uh, to art, and uh, really uh, was fascinated by the job that uh, this person teaching me art had. I was like, how did 
you get this job. And uh, so, you know, here I am. Oh. I, uh, I think I get interested in teaching. Um, I wanted to be an FBI agent. <laughs> that didn't work out. Um, and uh, honestly, I really did. I was going to be a fed. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but my parents were teachers, and they had some result. And um, you don't really think about that when you're a kid, because you just took it for granted. But I think as you got older, um, and I had the opportunity, I worked in the private sector for a little bit. And um, I admire anybody who can do that. Um, I mean, that in the best possible way. I was not meant for the private sector. And I much prefer to be in the classroom. And I kind of actually love teaching. I mean, that's really the simple, like, I love teaching. So I think that's, this for me is good. I always knew there was something about you, Mike. <laughs> Maybe your age is too much. Um, I'll just say, I'm not teaching anymore, but I'll just say that um, for me it's also, but I taught for 15 years. Um, but for me it, it's also generative, you know, so it changes me, it changes the students. Um, I mean, maybe that's kind of a selfish answer, but I feel like, you know, I was, I went into it to interact, with the, to change, to generate. <clears throat> necessarily teach here at SPCC, um, but I really enjoy um, getting to interact with all the different faculty and all the different students across the different mediums. Uh, I was really effective by my art instructors uh, growing up. In high school, I was really fortunate to have an uh, instructor who really took a personal um, interest in, in helping all the students um, feel seen and feel validated. Um, and I always wanted to try and be in a position to try and be like that for other people. And so getting to be here is, is a real privilege and honor. I feel like I, I get to kind of um, see a little bit of everything. So I'll just say real quick, I get asked that question a lot. Um, who, whenever someone's learning something, they're also teaching it, I think, that, to some degree. So our students are always teaching each other stuff. And when the, when the classroom's going well, that's happening. And I really like that. Uh, I learn a lot from the students. Hopefully they learn from me, they learn from each other. So when I was a student, I saw this happening and I realized, um, hey, that could be cool. What if I could do that for a living? And you know, there are some people who feel that if you end up teaching that you sort of failed as an artist. There's that kind of thing in there somewhere in our culture. But really early on, I understood, no, that's not really true. <laughs> that could be a really cool job. So I just felt lucky to be able to find opportunities to do that. Well, for, my, for myself, um, I, I, uh, I had really good instructors also, and um, the arts, I started making art when I was really young, um, and my, my father was very much against it, um, and you know, we pushed against each other a lot, but, uh, but I had great uh, instructors who, who told me things about um, you know, working in the community and, and teaching, um, in addition to making your artwork, because you probably won't make a living off of your art, and you probably won't be able to support yourself just by painting in the studio. And, um, and I think that's true for a lot of artists, um, you know, and, and so teaching, I think, is a natural, was a natural progression for me. Um, my father was a junior high administrator, um, and he was also a teacher. But, um, but the, the people that I met at a very young age um, with local, local artists guild and 
folks that were putting on art shows in my hometown. And, and that's what they were doing. They were painting murals and they were doing art shows, but they were also, um, they were also teaching in community, um, community centers and at, you know, in high schools and colleges and things like that. So, so I was kind of, it was impressed on me really, really early um, in my, my art life to, to be that. And, um, and then living in Southwest Alaska, was the first time I worked with a community college, and which is a very different environment, I think, from an art school or an art, you know, an arts university. Um, we have the opportunity to work with a lot of students that don't, that aren't pursuing art careers. They're focusing on nursing or, or uh, automotive, you know, industrial arts or, or something like that. But um, I think. Uh, you know, a couple of things that everybody hit on, and I'm just gonna jump to another question. And you all feel free to ask any questions too. Just jump in there, just leave that open. And then, um, but I, I was just gonna say that, uh, you know, my next question would be, how does, how does studying in the arts and humanities benefit a student here at SPSEC or just in general for you guys? Like, what's the benefit of the arts and humanities in, in education, especially for students that aren't be artists. I think it helps uh, in our culture of mass production. Um, everything, you know, you get it for a dollar, you know, or a little less. And there's, in our culture, a, a big lack of understanding of the value that art creates in our, in our world, um, how it's made. We're taking our classes, and especially, I think, really shows the general public just how much we're going to be creating something, fabricating something. Um, and so when people are trying to make living out the art um, out in the world, it really helps uh, if they've had some sort of experience in the classroom uh, where they see how much can go into that versus um, it just being mass produced. combination with the third question you have here, which, see how to say this, there's this book that I have read this year called The Whole Brain Child, I think is the name of it, and it talks about how the, the importance of creating a child that can um, integrate their emotions and their insight in the world, so they're connecting their left and their right brain. And I think that the arts and the humanities touches on a similar component of that. When we can tie the two sides of the brain together in um, instruction and learning, we can create a better human who can deal with a greater capacity. We're rewiring their brain and I'm not communicating it as well as I feel it and understand it and, and think that it's important in our education system, but I wish that we did more of that because it really brings a child and an adult into a better person when they can combine that emotional and logical component, and that's what the arts does. Is it, it, it takes that one step further because we're not just being able to discuss and verbalize something that we feel, but we're also able to make it, which is another step further. And it has a lot of potential to um, increase the a child's ability, whether it's they're a math person and they can then create a way to communicate visually how they're feeling. But I think it it's a strong, makes a stronger learner. say it's incredibly valuable, number one. Number two, I think for most people, and this is having gotten it from friends or family or other people, somebody who pursued a career that was undervalued, I think, um, just to be frank, if you want. I think a lot of people fall for 
many years, what are you doing, Mike, with your life? Mm -hmm. um, but um, as somebody who's involved in media production, as somebody who teaches media making, uh, like out of the gate, I think on any given evening, when people are together talking about something, chances are they're talking about something they're consuming. Video games or whatever, and I don't think as a culture we ever think nearly deeply enough about that stuff that we're consuming. Um, uh, so part of I think you know, the value that I see is that you're just getting people to think about things that they're ingesting, um, putting into themselves, um, uh, and then I would say you know uh, another just kind of simple thing. number one skill that I probably teach in filmmaking class is teaching students to communicate with one another. Because they're in a team, they got to make a film. And that skill is a skill that we acquire if you're a big communicator in any profession that you have. If you're, you can't communicate, you can't work with a team, you can't figure out a problem, uh, then, then you're not really going to do well. So I think all sorts of skills, I'm sure that like just going down the line, either way, that these skills, they're not always quantifiable. And I think that that's a, a danger thing. I think there is, we live in a culture where we love to quantify, and we love to look at numbers, and we love to talk about data. But I don't want to talk about any of that stuff, <laughs> uh, personally, because I find it pretty boring. Um, so I think there's lots of skills that people are getting undervalue the arts, we undervalue what this does for, for people, especially at a community college, especially at a community college. Um, I think it's, it's undervalued. I see lights turning on all the time in every class that I teach. Uh, there's various students at some point when they start making those connections. And I think that's, that's value enough. Understanding the question, you mean kind of thinking about um, what you're doing on a small level? Well, yeah, just detail and big picture. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the devil is in the details. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we always have this conversation constantly. It's like what matters is what's in the frame. And if you if you let any aspect of that fall down, you know, it's okay. We're learning. It's fine to fall down. Uh -oh. But can't underestimate anything because there are so many components that go into collaborative, any part that's collaborative. So I think you, know, you have wardrobe, you have camera people, you have technicians, you have all these components, and nothing can fall down if it's going to be really, really good. And if it does fall down, that's fine. That's a, a, a lesson. Or that's something that you should think about. Films, um, every film I've ever made, I can see where it falls in. And then you try to get that right the next time. So I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about zooming in and out. Yeah, I mean, I, that would be, it, I think an easier default way of thinking for humans is the detail. I think it takes more for the discipline to look at the macro vision. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely the detail. I mean, there's details in everything I just saw on um, bottoms. Excellent. If you haven't seen Bottoms, go see Bottoms. It, it's a film, it's in the theaters now, the, the, the multiplex. Uh, it's doing very well. 
like there's so much attention to detail in that film that it's a piece of art, but it's a group of artists coming together, focusing on these details, and that matters. That matters. You can't underestimate it. I don't know. It might look effortless, but um, thinking about what you said, John, you know, just the appreciation of being able to make something and the time that goes into that, it, it's very, it's not easy. And I suppose I'll add on to that again. Um, that, uh, I think that, you know, in college and university, we're teaching habits of mind and ways of thinking. I mean, even more so than individual you know, classes. Kind of. We're teaching discipline, you know, like you're talking about, Leo, and we're teaching uh, just ways to approach the world that you know, matter. And so, so for the arts, for me, I think of that experience that we have going into you come out and you're looking at the world, <laughs> you know, you look up at the, the street lamp and it has this aesthetic quality that maybe you never thought about before. I mean, I always have that experience when I come out. Um, and so I think that part of art education is about that. It's about you know, ways of seeing the world and, um, and paying attention to aesthetics. I like to think that I'm uh, getting people to slow down um, especially in the field of photography. It takes a millisecond to take a picture. You've already forgotten you took it five minutes later, and you get a bunch of likes. Or in my case, I probably won't. Um, so getting them to slow down and be really willing to make mistakes. Like I try to like flatter them for their errors as much as anything, because that shows that they're trying to be a little bold and be a little risky. And if I've done that with them, then I'm done. I'm done. They get an A. I guess. Bueller. Bueller. Uh, I think that students have a challenge with uh, confidence in, in order for them to be successful in life. They need to be confident in themselves and they need to be able to take some ownership over the world. And, and when they feel that by somebody else and they're behind and they'll never catch up, um, then oftentimes, you know, there's a self-defeating aspect to that. And so, you know, one of the things that we talked about was that idea of the qualitative assessment um, of looking at work. We do critiques and students uh, get an opportunity to share uh, something that they have done, something that they have created, and in a group environment, um, you know, start to build confidence. They build confidence in speaking in a group um, and they build confidence in what they can produce and, and I think that is, serves them uh, for a lifetime and uh, in, in many other areas. Just to say real quick, there's pretty good evidence that humans were doing art a couple hundred thousand years ago. And so when, when, when I meet a new class, I'm, I'm thinking about where we can take it, but I'm also aware from what they share with me that they already feel like they're, they're artists to some degree. It's picking up a little bit on what Melissa was saying, you know, just nurturing that. Just, I would say you, could, you might be able to argue that if we didn't study this, we didn't have this in our society and culture, we wouldn't survive without it. Art saves lives. Um, I, I think, um, you know, kind of riffing off, especially what Krisha said, you know, that, um, but we, with students, there's, we've got this, um, we've got a craft and a practice, and we're working with material, and then we have the concepts, some history to it, and in the studio arts, there, there's a kind of a learning to learn, and learning how to teach yourself, um, how to navigate problems. That kind of that goes beyond, I think, um, some other disciplines because there's a step-by-step -step process, and so you can learn these um, 
these skill sets that, that I think can be valuable in life and, and passing on that information. Um, like Joe says, you know, we're a part of a much bigger story. Um, I also agree with, with Steve about slowing, slowing things down. I mean, I think that's one of the, <clears throat> one of the uh, kind of the overarching um, ideas about higher education is to slow your thinking. And as a studio artist teaching drawing, um, you know, teaching students how to see differently and see and see the world in a different way, and to slow their looking, um, especially nowadays, I think it's imperative for us to to spend more quality time just being with something and studying its edges and its textures, and and I think sometimes just that that meditative practice for for students um, is is vital, um, in life, especially for young students. Anybody else? Yeah. Why is it important? Why the hell do we do this? Any other questions for anybody about that? No? Okay. Well, we can go down the list here. Does somebody want to ask one of these questions? John, you want to ask uh, <laughs> ask number eight of the group? The million dollar question. How do you find a balance between creative output and technical proficiency in the classroom? Yeah, how do you find that balance between creative output and technical proficiency? My, my strategy always is a broken clock is right twice a day. That's my approach. What do you mean by that? I just keep throwing stuff at the wall. There are two broken clocks in the ceramic studio. <laughs> That's true. As, as we speak, there are two broken clocks. Chuck, can you clarify the question? Yeah, it could be. I mean, either from from a, a, an instructor's, you know, how how do you keep your own creative, um, you know, output going, and then also teaching that your craft. I mean, that's that's a that's a dance that that happens all the time, and and I think sometimes, like for me, it happens differently in my mind uh, when I'm outside of the classroom, and sometimes I get. I mean, I've been teaching in different different venues since my early 20s, and I still get nervous sometimes going into the classroom. And sometimes I just wing it. I just throw out whatever I have and, you know, done in the past or whatever, and I just go, okay, well, let's see what happens, right? Um, so, but then I think, you know, especially for students, I mean, it's really hard to say, okay, be creative, make something, but then also don't forget to edit the film and learn how to hold the camera, learn how to hold the brush. So how are there things that, I mean, that's my example. I just sometimes wing it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, basic philosophy in my class is essentially to create very specific parameters and then allow freedom within those parameters. And so as long as the student is able to hit the parameters that I'm asking for, right, that's technical proficiency and then within that small space, and it might be a very small space, um, then that's where they have this ability to do whatever they want, as long as it's when they can find space. And that works generally pretty well in my class. I think there's a phrase called you can't have freedom without structure. And I think that is similar where I want to often give full creative exploration, but that structure really helps. So there's always, for me, a built-in technical component that they're trying to work on, while they're also trying to find that creative piece that connects them to why they're doing it and making it personal. Another question. Yeah, I have a question. 
I'm just curious, how do you think artificial intelligence is going to affect what you're doing in terms of being creative and, and you know, looking at the technology aspects and everything? Melissa? I mean, you're not teaching, <laughs> but, but I think, I mean, because AI's had a really pronounced impact on writing, for example. And uh, I'll consult the oracle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that is the question. Shaking higher ed, and it's the it is the question that's shaking higher ed and art and I mean as you all as, as visual artists I'd be curious to hear your responses. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass. I, I, I turn it into an assignment, and it's not a well thought out assignment because I don't understand it. Yeah. They will understand it. I don't have to. I'll be dead before I start <laughs> um, But I give them an assignment where they are not allowed to take a picture for 24 hours even on their phone, and then they have to write about what they wanted to take, and then they dump that into artificial intelligence, and they get the results. And some of them, one woman said her husband thought it was literally a picture of her. It was that close. You know, others are like insane, you know, deer dancing with flying pears or something. But uh, it's kind of, I don't six, like it. Six fingers, yeah. they often have six fingers. Or yeah. like, I mean, I think conceptually, um, it'll change our conception of what an artist is, what a copyright is, who owns it, what's an original idea. I mean, I think it, in my mind, it'll just ricoch ricochet out in those directions. I mean, I think on the ground, we struggle with plagiarism and cheating, and, you know, these kind of puerile issues. But I think in the bigger scheme of things, it'll change everything, the way we think about art. And some, I mean, you know, there are discussions about, um, you know, speculation that, well, this, you know, AI will impact the, the arts in, you know, much the way the camera did in, you know, the 19th century. Um, I, I don't necessarily su subscribe to this, you know, wholly, but, you know, there's an idea that photography impacted, you know, painting and the visual arts in, in such a way that it um, prompted artists to start thinking about the mind more about emotions. I, I would argue that that was happening way before um, the camera, but the camera did have an impact on the visual arts, and I think artificial intelligence will have the same kind of impact that, you know, we'll, we will be forced to develop a new language. Um, you know, it's just like things that are happening with, with language today, with, uh, you know, with gender and pronouns. It's like we're having to come up with new, new ways of, of thinking about the world, um, and I, AI, I don't think it's going to be it doesn't really impact my classes. Um, my my students, I like to say, were kind of in the trenches in boot camp with foundations drawing, and so um, they they're genuine. They're there. Their hands are getting dirty. Um, but you know, for digital photography, uh, um, as well as you know, maybe with film, I don't know, Mike, what are you thinking about? Um, probably gonna have an unpopular answer. I'm really not that worried. It's just a tool. Um, so it's happening. Um, uh, I think that we're seeing it at the ground level first right now in the education sector. But I think where we'll, I think it's going to be adopted pretty quickly in the professional sector. Um, anything you read, like we're going to move to a point where most of the things you read are probably AI assisted. So maybe not written by AI. Somebody's going to have some assistance from a program. Um, so, I don't know. I'm, but in the end, it's just a tool. Um, we're not at the singularity yet. <laughs> um, like, that hasn't happened. I don't see that coming. I do see in film and video, one thing that is happening now is that they use AI to edit. So you have, like, um, and this is more like the industrial film making level. If you're just making a video, a corporate video, um, where it's just some talking heads and people, and you're in a very set uh, or very tight uh, set of time constraints, you might use that AI to, to, to edit for you. Um, and then go in and do some minor video. But I just don't see it as this, I mean, even in my, where students are using it to write papers. It's 
this, and it's like, well, what are you doing? You know, like, I probably know. I, I might not say anything because it might not be the battle I want to fight that day, but I kind of know it. I spot it because it reads like W. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And you're not really, is that how you want to learn? Is that how you want to use this? But I don't think it's good or bad. I think it's just a thing um, that's happening, much like the smartphone. And we do as a culture tend to want to, and film, same thing. Film came around and people was like, oh, this is, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> film is evil. Hollywood Babylon. <laughs> you know? Well, Mike, what do you make of the, uh, the Hollywood strike on that note? I mean, you know, because they all walked out you mean them using AI to replace? It's not yeah, the screenwriter is. It's not because people are smarter than that. Like that's yeah, that's where creativity comes in. Like I think that there will be a place. I mean, your example, using having someone use this and understand it. That is the world they want to hear. They are going to go into that world and have to work facing this stuff. And why resist it? Like I can't. This is beyond me. It's like. If you want to use chat GPT to help you figure some stuff out, use it. But I don't think it's going to write meaningful cinema <laughs> that I would want to watch. Uh, it's just not there. And I don't see it being there in our life. Yeah, maybe. But I don't see it. But is that even by the screen? Yeah, I mean, I was, I'm just curious. As a filmmaker, what you... I mean, it looks like they've come to it to terms. I yeah. don't know what those terms are. But, um, but clearly the whole... Film industry is freaked out about. <laughs> well, well, yeah, yeah, Drew Barrymore. I mean, she was one of the ones who's going to have a. She was launching a chat show, a talk show, and she, her people, what they were, it was some sort of stick. Um, I don't know. They didn't go look at AI. Uh, just, I just, I'm, I'm just not concerned. Um, I'm not concerned. I'm more concerned about how people with infinite power use this stuff. That's what concerns me, of bad actors. But not, not the education, but I have always yeah, been concerned about that. If you've got too much money, and too much time on your hands, they worry me far more. Um, I've got uh, something to kind of add on to that. Um, I remember in high school going to the State Art Symposium and being blown away by these uh, beautiful paintings. And then about an hour into the show, I started noticing something in the little corner in the tag saying, um, I think they're called Dinkley Prints. And it was a photo editing program where you could just you know, have your photo and it would turn it into this image that looked like a beautiful painting printed out on a canvas so it you know, looked like um, someone had actually painted it. And feeling so uh, betrayed, you know, someone who's tried so hard to paint something and having it turn out, you know, mediocre. Um, but again, I think it's just another tool. You know, I think people were really freaked out when Photoshop first came out, um, and now that's like our basic um, like tool that we use every day. Um, you know, same thing. I think a lot of our mediums, new technology comes out. I remember the thing with 3D printers it being a huge. Oh, it's going to replace making things. Now it's become just another standard tool that we use to create things. So I can definitely see, especially in writing and other things, how it could be a concern in some things. But I think ultimately it'll just be a tool that's being used. Um, I'll just jump in a little bit on that. This topic comes up a lot lately. I think one of the reasons is because we're all kind of morbidly fascinated by it, <laughs> and we're also afraid of it. Um, I know it's just another tool, but when I was an art student, it, the, uh, the new tool was photocopier. You know, that, but that did color. Um, and I think about uh, what we've got with technology and media. Think about it like, well, when the airplane was new, how that changed things. When the automobile came along, that really changed things. But this tide of te a technological change to media, uh, now we have airplanes flying without people on them, or at least without pilots, and cars driving around without uh, a driver, and there's laws being made in different states that allow this, and that maybe that's fine, maybe they're a better driver than me, <laughs> but it's, 
I am not up to thinking that it's just another tool. I think it's different. But I agree that it is something that we can deal with. And what I talk to my students about is you got to engage with this. Like Mike said, we can't just let big tech feed it to us as passive consumers. We need to engage with it. And artists can help us ask the questions and see the different sides of these things in ways that maybe a, a tech company or a product of some kind can't. So I encourage students to engage with it in some way. Yeah, I think it's interesting uh, philosophically to think about um, you know, how it raises these questions of authorship and like origins of creative output where you know, who, <coughs> who is responsible for that creative act? And you know, maybe there's somewhere inside, you know, I, I think sometimes it's like being afraid to lose that control that something else is gonna have control over uh, creativity or, um, or something of that nature. But it, um, when cars are driving themselves and you know, computers are thinking for us, that it's kind of, that's destabilizing in some way. Right? There are a few movies out. I think Megan, has anybody seen that? That's super scary. It's like an AI, you <laughs> know what? And I heard on the radio today, NPR, there's another one called Creatures. You, have you seen it? <laughs> it's like a six-year-old who like destroys the world, or tries at least, AI. Um, so I think Hollywood's not helping um, suppress the scary part of the whole situation. Just real quick, there, there are uh, detectors, so I use a AI detector for students writing, so I know um, if, say, you know, there's a 50% chance or an 80% chance that a portion of this text uh, was generated through AI. The, you know, the other way is uh, to have them quote the specific sections of the text, and then also to make sure they're using their own opinion. Uh, when we're talking about artwork, it's harder you know, to source opinions. You know, and get it, trying to make sure it's in the student's own voice. So those are some ways. Uh, and then, of course, that's random. <laughs> or 3D printers, I don't know, maybe. Yes. Do 3D printing and ceramics combining? Sure. I don't know. That's, that's another thing that I think is kind of interesting about, I, there was an artist in here today um, visiting from New York, uh, installation artist from, uh, from Mexico, I believe, um, and uh, just having this discussion about um, how the arts you know, is, and, and the sciences and biology, they all have these very specific opinions about the world, about things that are happening. Um, and, and art should have a seat at the table also, having these conversations. And I think art, AI is really bringing a lot of these artistic disciplines and the humanities into a broader discussion of the science, um, too. But I think, I think the arts also has the, the flexibility and the scope to embrace these technologies, like Steve was saying, it's just like, well, why fight it? You know, it's like, let's make it an assignment. Let's let's bring it in and, and try to try to work with this thing and see what can come out of it. And, um, and I think that's really important for students and, and also us, you know, as teachers to be like, oh, okay, here's this new thing. And like you said, let them, you know, because it's too, it's, it's an exchange and a dialogue teaching. It's not just a one-sided one-sided thing, kind of banking, you know, a form of educating. Do you guys have any questions for each other? Believe it or not, it's like we're almost at seven o'clock. So this just kind of goes right by. Um, your assignment was to maybe think about questions for each other. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, was not required, uh, but, you know. Is anybody curious about each other? I mean, we don't get to talk like this very often, sometimes passing in the hallway, but this is fun to, to be able to sit here and talk. Anyone? How do you know you had a successful course? <laughs> hey, at the end of the class, how do you know, what, well, how do you measure that? Sometimes I walk away from it, like, oh, it didn't go so well. What's that? 
the work is good and I'm happy to be and I hate me. It's probably the thing that matters. <laughs> Well, sometimes there's a lag time. I'll just say that. So I'm not I'm not teaching here again, but um, but I used to teach gender studies, and when the Barbie and we always had a Barbie unit to talk about gender and stuff. And when the Barbie movie came out this summer, I heard from loads of former students, <laughs> people who I didn't think I had reached, and you know, and all this kind of stuff. And so to me, I was like, that's a success, right? And they're thinking about this class they took ten years. So I think sometimes there's a lag time, sometimes we don't see it. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's these two different ways of looking at it, too. It's like you, you shut the door in the classroom, you walk out, and you're like, oh, that was just, I, I don't think I was, you know, conveyed things clearly enough, or that, you know, God, they were all looking at me like I was, I was stupid. But then there's that, that bigger impact that you have that you don't always see right away. Um, yeah, and students reach out through social media or where you see them having shows, art shows somewhere. Anybody else? How, how, did, how do you guys determine if it's successful? I don't know <laughs> the answer to that question. But I agree, there is lag time. And you just gotta have faith, man, that you're doing a good job and you reach somebody in that class, and they do crawl out of the woodwork, you know, eventually. I mean, in a good way. <laughs> um, I love it when I um, get an email. I just got an, uh, actually a message from a student from 10 years ago that she's like, you know, you changed my life. Um, it was actually about the student show, because I took one of, uh, put one of her works in the student show. Um, and she's like, ever since then, you know, that was such, had such an impact on me. And I continue to paint. She's painting fish and, fishing lures, um, which is brilliant, I think. Um, they're like portraits of fishing lures. Um, I'm like, you could sell these. Um, but, you know, like, I put my phone down. I'm like, oh my god, maybe I should keep teaching. Like, I may <laughs> somebody out there cares from 10 years ago. So that's a tough question, Bruce. Yeah, it can be a thankless, thankless job at times, and we don't really see it until, until something happens. Anybody want to share anything else? Does Edgar want to join us? <laughs> oh, hi, Edgar. Edgar has paintings over there on the Does anyone else have uh, questions? Anyone in the audience have questions for, for folks up here? Can we start with question one for uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start over. No one has any questions? Okay. I, if I could, I'd love to know more about your work, Steve. If, if there's anything more you could tell us about your pieces, I think they're fabulous, and I'm dying to know more about them. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Because um, there is a context to them which is missing because of the text. Um, the one on the far left, those are prisoners from the Shelton Prison, the Washington Correction Center. And it took me some time, but I eventually got access to get in there, and they have a clothing donation system, and. So the indigent prisoners, when they are released, and many of them are, they get some nice clothes so they can hopefully get a job. So for that day, they had the opportunity to pick anything they want. And if you look close, you'll see many of them are actually wearing the same attire. <laughs> because they were all taken at different times, and then they were, they were uh, placed together in that awful program, Photoshop. Um, so, and it was quite an experience. I sent them all pictures. They got pictures of themselves. Um, some were almost in tears because they hadn't been in civilian clothes since they were locked up, which was many years for some of them. And then these six here are portraits taken at the uh, Olympia Union Gospel Mission. Um, some are staff and some are not. 
Um, and there's really no backstory to, well, actually I asked them to write a little something and some of them did. So there are some text narratives that go along with them. Um, and I do a lot of portraits that tend to deal with people that are sort of hidden. So I've done a lot with prisons and juvenile incarceration and um, mental disabilities and things like that. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great expression of you know, just being an artist, being an educator, being a part of the community, you know, and how all those things just kind of overlap and coalesce. And it's cool. It's good. Well, Edgar, your paintings are hilarious. <clears throat> and so I'd love to hear more about them. Anything particular you want like to know about them? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what inspired <laughs> Bill Gates and... Yeah, oh, you recognize them, okay. Um, I, I guess they're not, they're loosely tied together, I suppose. Um, I think primarily my um, angle for these or trajectory was um, um, picking up the powerful, just generally. Um, <laughs> and um, just questioning the notion of wealth disparity and, and how it, that uh, kind of infiltrates um, so many parts of our culture. And, uh, I like to deal with those kinds of subjects that are, that are serious um, um, and in introduce or interject humor. Sorry, I got <clears throat> something in my throat. But anyway, um, interject humor so that they're not quite so heavy when you, you know, when you encounter them. I think the small scale helps with that too. Um, you're not blasted with, with an idea, um, and overwhelmed by it, and have to bring yourself into it. I suppose that's one of the, my approaches to these. Yeah. What else have to say about that? Any other questions thank, about that? No, thank you. That's great. That's great. I really like them. Thank you. Okay, well, um, if there aren't any questions from folks visiting the gallery tonight, um, and you all are spent, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Um, thank you all for coming, and um, feel free to stick around for a bit, and you, know, you can ask the artist questions. There, are, there may still be some gallery guides up near the door. Um, those of you that do have them, if you're finished with them, you, know, you can pass them on to someone else. Um, but the gallery guides uh, have information corresponding to the numbers on the wall about the work. And thank you guys for coming tonight um, and for showing your work in, in, in the show. And um, thank you all for coming. Have a great night.